Okay, so this is the third uh, and final video in my sort of introduction to evolutionary game theory series. And in the previous videos, if you haven't seen those, you can go and take a look. I gave an introduction to kind of the analogy between classical games and uh, evolutionary games and some definitions. And then I also talked in quite a bit of detail about a few example matrix games and how to solve them and that they're useful when traits are categorical. But in biology, a lot of the traits that we're interested in are continuous traits, right? And so some examples that I gave from uh, this paper by Sandra Diaz et al. Um, you know, gives a, a bunch of examples for plants, right? And the most obvious one would be plant height, that you can have everything, you can have any plant height from, you know, 140 meter tall tropical trees down to, you know, Arabidopsis thaliana, which is, you know, maybe only a couple centimeters tall until it, it fruits at least. Um, and that height is obviously a continuous trait. And so there is game theory for continuous traits as well, which is considerably more useful in, uh, in, in biology, right? So just giving a bit of a quick review back to um, the matrix games. Remember, you know, in a two by two game, we've described fitness consequences in different possible worlds, right? You could have a world where everyone does one kind of thing or a different world where everyone does the other kind of thing, right? And what we have are discrete fitness consequences. Remember, I showed these to you when you had letters, A, B, C, and D, right? So each of those worlds had discrete consequences. There were sort of four fitness numbers you had to pay attention to. Well, in continuous evolutionary game theory, then you just have continuous consequences, right? So that the relationship between traits and fitness becomes continuous. And the way that, uh, there's a couple of different ways to do that. One way is sort of adaptive dynamics. It's a more European tradition. And the other way is Darwinian dynamics, which is the kind that I generally use, developed by Tom Vinson and Joel Brown. And so, um, for that, we use something called the fitness generating function. And the idea of the fitness generating function, you know, it's G for game or G for generating. The idea then is that fitness becomes a function of three different things. And if you remember back to my introductory video, um, it should be obvious what those three things are gonna be. So the first thing is gonna be V. And we use V and U simply because T is normally um, used for time and V and U are near to T. But V is gonna be, uh, the focal trait, right? So if you're watching me in a game of checkers, that's my strategy or my trait in the game. Now, of course, in ecology and evolution, we have potentially many different kinds of things out in nature, right? So let's imagine a community of four different plants and let's imagine that the trait we're interested in is how tall they are, right? Taller plants shade shorter ones and this probably drove the evolution of, of plant height over uh, evolutionary time. So to understand my fitness in a community of these four plants that potentially vary in height, we need to know my height, but we need to know the potential heights of everyone else in the community, right? So this is vector notation. So u is a, a vector that is four elements long, right? So u is going to contain the height of all strategies, including myself, because I might compete with uh, intraspecific neighbors within a species. What's cool about evolutionary game theory then is that we can also have a vector of population sizes, n. So that vector is the same length as u. So each species has a trait and each species has a population size, right? And what's cool about this is it's a really natural way of scaling from the individual level to the community level, right? So we can capture the interactions that individuals are having by linking their trait evolution to their population dynamics. It's going back to this idea of the ecological theater and the evolutionary play. And so how do we find the ESS in this continuous game? Well, it's basically the same thing as before. We want to find what trait or traits have uh, the highest fitness such that no other uh, trait could demographically invade that population, right? And so um, in a matrix game, it was as simple as comparing a couple of numbers to see which ones were bigger. In continuous ones, we know how to find the maximum of a continuous function, right? We set the derivative equal to zero and the second derivative has to be negative, right? That's just straightforward uh, freshman calculus, right? So we can write this in a fancy way, but this is no more complicated than anything you did in your high school or freshman calculus class. So find the derivative of g with respect to v, set that equal to zero, and that gives you the maximum or minimum of a function, and we can guarantee it's a fitness maximum rather than a minimum by checking the second derivative. Super old, simple calculus tricks. We also need the population to no longer be growing. And since, remember, fitness, or G, is the per capita population growth rate at the ecological and evolutionary equilibrium, then, then 
the population won't be growing anymore, so g will be equal to zero in a continuous game. And what's cool is we can track the population ecology. So the population size is changing according to whatever the current size is times the fitness, right? Everyone has this much many babies. And so we can project population sizes through time uh, in this way uh, for every individual in the population by setting V equal to whatever the species. Remember we had four in the other example. So we would need four equations and we would solve them all individually. So that's how populations change. And then strategies change according to the derivative here. There's some mutation rate that generates new types of uh, genetic variation. And then the strategy is simply gonna change by moving up or down the selection gradient, again, for all possible combinations of species. So there's nothing here that's more complicated than anything you did in your freshman calculus class. And I always tell people that it's, it's honestly not even as hard as that because a lot of that trig function stuff that you had to learn is almost never relevant in biology. I, sometimes it is, but very rarely. And so um, this really isn't as complicated as it looks. But in case um, you know the mathematical notation is stressing you out, the key thing you should understand is that in the matrix game, where we were basically looking for uh, you know which couple out of four numbers were the biggest, now we need to look among an infinite number of strategies and an infinite number of possible fit fitness outcomes, and we expect selection to move up these gradients, right? So if we started here at a non-ESS resident, we would expect evolution to proceed up towards this peak. Um, so what does one of these games actually look like? Well, usually they're just some uh, population growth model, um, where, where remember, fitness is your per capita population growth rate. Um, and so the G function is just going to be your favorite population model with um, V and U stuck in. And sometimes people use X instead of N for population size. The people that are more mathematically inclined use X as population size, and the more biologically inclined people use N. But just I put that in here just in case. You might see that sometimes, right? And remember, the ESS is the strategy or strategies that once they're present, they can't be invaded and can invade, right? Exactly the same as before, but now we find it with calculus. And what's cool is that if we have this non-ESS resident um, that is in the population, and we know selection is gonna drive it up the selection gradient, um, we have this sort of what we call an evolutionary invasion window, right? So just like the matrix game, you could compare four numbers and figure out what the ESS was. Well, here we know that uh, everything outside of this window, so down here, and down here is gonna have negative population growth. So if we get a mutant in that area, it's just going to go extinct. But everything in this area is gonna have a higher population growth rate than this, and so it should be able to gradually replace it. And so as evolution takes us closer and closer to the ESS, what we expect is that the population growth rate will also decline. And so this fitness landscape actually changes shape at, during the course of evolution. If you take nothing away from this part of the lecture, it's that these, uh, this fitness landscape or this adaptive landscape is not a static place. It's constantly changing shape during the course of evolution. So, you know, like I said, I'm just gonna summarize what I said. To find the ESS is a bit more complicated, but not really that much more, right? We just need to find what is the biggest, uh, what is the trait that has the highest fitness? Right? And we just use calculus. So we need the first derivative to be equal to zero, and we need the second derivative to be negative. That ensures we're at a maximum, not a minimum. Since the ESS is about stability, we also expect the population should be at some kind of ecological equilibrium. In other words, the change in population growth through time should be zero. There's no more population change. Since G is that rate, then we need the G, at ESS we need G to be equal to zero. This introduces another solution concept in addition to the ESS, which is known as convergent stability, which I'll show you now. So to understand this concept of convergent stability and the fact that the fitness landscape can actually change through time, I wanna show you sort of a video. Who doesn't love a good math video inside a video? So what you can do is you can record the dynamics of the game through time to create sort of a moving graph. So what I'm gonna show you here is uh, strategy evolution, the evolutionary dynamics. So you're gonna see the strategy that I'm just gonna arbitrarily start at two and it's gonna evolve down to zero, which is a stable equilibrium. Population size is gonna start at two individuals and go up to the carrying capacity, which I've set to 100. Um, and it's gonna do both of these things in 300 uh, generations. So what you're looking at here is generations on the x-axis, strategy value or trait on the y-axis, and population size 
on the x-axis. Over here is the fitness landscape or the adaptive landscape. This is basically the equivalent of the matrix game. Remember the matrix game was describing possible worlds. Now those set of possible worlds are continuous. There's an infinite number of them. But we can visualize them by actually looking at the continuous relationship between fitness and strategies which actually changes in, through time depending on the available mutations. And remember, this, require, this requires a bunch of different conditions, right? So we expect that trait to stop changing so that the, um, so that the uh, evolutionary change is zero. We expect the population to stop changing so that the population growth rate is zero. We expect that the um, trait uh, is, an, uh, is an ESS, which means it is at a maximum defined by these two things through calculus, right? So uh, setting the derivative of G with respect to V equal to zero finds us whether uh, finds us um, the roots of the equation and then making sure that we get the value for V that satisfies the second derivative being negative ensures that we're uh, at a maximum, not at a minimum. So let me show you how this works. Um, Remember this axis here from minus two to two is the same as this axis here from minus two to two. So what you see, if I pause it, is that we've had about 40 generations. The trait has come down from two to about one. And we see that here from two over to one. You can rewind the video if you wanna see it again. And that the population has grown from two individuals to around 60. And as we continue this, you're going to see that the evolution is going to proceed up the landscape until it reaches a peak. But right now that peak is over here around minus one. Remember that the, the landscape is going to change through time. And we can see as it does, the ESS ends up being at a trait value of zero. And don't really worry what this trait represents. It's just math right now. So we can see after 300 generations, we have an ESS that this trait of zero has the highest fitness. Just like in the matrix game, we were comparing four numbers to see which was the highest. Now we're just comparing an infinite number of them using continuous calculus. So that's why it's an ESS, is because it's at the top and it's convergent stable because we could start it from any direction and it's always gonna come back to the same place. So I happen to start it at two, but you could just as easily start it at minus two and it would go back to this exact same value. Just like a matrix game, you can get many strategies coexisting. And the way that this happens in continuous uh, games is that you can often get these um, evolutionarily unstable minima, right? So in this case, the same thing is happening as before. We're getting no change in traits. We're getting no change in population dynamics. And we're finding that the first derivative is equal to zero, but um, the second derivative is greater than zero. That means it's going to a minimum on the landscape. And what's interesting about this is that it will be ecologically stable until there's a mutation or some kind of invasion like we had on that island in part two of this video series. In that case then, um, the two things will repel each other and start climbing up the hill just like before. So let me show you what that looks like. So we have the one species at a, right around here, we get a speciation event. And so the one starts going this way and then they both end up falling back into valleys. You can see every time a new speciation event occurs, there's one, we get a new population entering the community. So there's now three different populations of three species with three different trait values, all sitting at minima. So this is convergence stable. You could start it here or you could start it there and it would go back to the same place, but these are not ESSs because literally anything can invade this community of now four species. So there we go. We've got an eight species community that's convergence stable, but it's not ESS which is really interesting. You see, this could be potentially a mechanism of understanding how faunal buildup works through time. Now, people always wanna know, what if you have more than one trait? Well, that's fine, we can do that too. I can only draw you a picture if we have two traits because now we have a sort of two different trait axes and we have fitness on the, on the z-axis, right? And in this case, you just need to have the partial derivatives uh, the first and second partial derivative with respect to trait one have to satisfy the ESS sort of maximum principle and the second trait has to, and if you have a third trait, it has to as well, and, and so on. This is sort of how partial derivatives work. So you can sort of do like a double or triptal or as many different optimizations as you want. So let's, I wanna show you an example of what these continuous games look like. And I wanna do this with an annual plant game that's one of the earlier games that was developed. So let's start by just looking at it as a population model. So imagine you have an annual plant. They only live for one year. 
Um, and we can imagine that they have some maximum possible fecundity, right? This would be the geometric rate of population growth if they were the only thing in the world. Like if none of their offspring ever died, you would expect population to grow at this rate, right? But we could imagine then that, of course, competitor density is going to reduce the actual realized fecundity, right? So you could start with one individual, then they're going to have lambda babies, and then those babies are going to compete, and the next generation might have fewer realized fecundity. Uh, so if nj is the population competitor density, there's you know two ways to reduce a number. One is to do a subtraction, the other is to divide. So we're going to divide here. And you can imagine there might be many species, right? So we want to maybe sum this up from j equals 1 to however many species are in the community. This is an annual plant game, so we really only want competition to occur from the individuals who germinated, right? So some individuals can stay in the seed bank, and they're probably not going to be effective competitors. And then we could imagine there's some coefficient that determines the competitive uh, the competition coefficient. You can imagine this is basically just the slope of how competitor density reduces per capita population growth rate. And if it redu reduces it at the sort of like uh, negative exponential, then again, we would expect to put it in the, in the uh, bottom of a fraction like this. And then you could imagine if there are no competitors, then you know we don't want to divide by zero, so we could stick a one on here. And then what you get here is F represents the realized fecundity of species I, an individual of species I, after it's competed with all the um, seeds that germinated in the community. Um, whenever you're watching this, let's just imagine we had information about 2019 and we wanted to predict what's going to happen in 2020, right? So the way we do this mathematically is we imagine T is 2019, and T plus 1 would be next year, that's 2020, or the current year that I'm recording this. So here's, we, we're going to use F, so our realized fecundity obviously is important, right? It matters how many seeds each individual actually gets. Uh, again, it's going to matter how many germinate, right? Because if some seeds don't germinate, they don't get to reproduce. These are annual plants. And we want to keep track of all the seeds that didn't germinate because they don't, uh, they get to stay in the population. They just don't get to participate in having babies. And then we want to maybe keep only the ones that survive. So we remove the ones that died from the population because some seeds in the seed bank that don't germinate might die. And then multiply this by the current population density or the current number of seeds, and we can forecast the population growth rate in the next year. And so what you've got here is a really simple model of the population dynamics of an annual plant. You've got the geometric rate of growth or the maximum seed production, the germination rate, the seed survival rate, the current population size in, in seeds, because remember this is tracking the seed bank, and alpha is the competitive coefficient that we can measure demographically by comparing um, the per capita population growth rate along a uh, gradient of competitor density. Okay, so that is a population model for an annual plants that are competing that um, is the uh, and remember, a population model is the base of any continuous game. But how do we take that population model and make it into a game? Um, and I should say that this was a model that was one of the earliest game theory models, this annual plant one um, from Reese and Westaby in 1997. It's a really cool paper. Um, well, remember, a G function is going to potentially have my trait, everyone else's traits, and everyone else's population size. So we already know how to deal with population size, and I just showed you that on the previous slides. Um, it turns out in this discrete form of the game that populations are going to grow according to this ratio of nt plus 1 divided by nt, right? This is the number that you would multiply nt by, because remember that's how populations grow. It's g times nt gives us the next population size. And if we multiply it by this ratio, then nt is going to cancel. So that's how we define g if in the discrete form of the game. Remember that by just dividing both sides of the equation that we derived on the previous screen by uh, nt, uh, we're going to get this equation, so just with nt moved over to here. And so then how do we um, introduce the trait values? Well, people tend to draw, and here's a picture I pulled from the literature, people tend to draw trait values as Gaussian distributions, right? That there's some mean trait in a population, and central limit theorist theorem tells us that they're probably normally distributed around that mean with the genetic variation of a population. And so if we imagine that seed survival and seed germination are traits of species already, right? we could start to think, okay, well, maybe the rest of the traits of a plant are going to determine its maximum possible fecundity. 
And we can do this by basically using the formula for the Gaussian distribution around some observed maximum fecundity in the environment. So we could argue that there's some trait value, maybe right in the middle of this whole community that's gonna maximize the fit of form and function, no matter who the species is. And that's gonna be B. And that any deviation away from that, V, so if you're over here, you're deviated from the maximum value, that's gonna potentially reduce your maximum fecundity. And so we just do that normally around some community mean. Um, and if you want to have multivariate traits, that's fine. The multivariate Gaussian distribution looks something like this. So all this is saying is that your, uh, the further your traits are away from this ideal value that is set by the environment, the lower your fecundity will be. And what this does is it drives um, stabilizing selection. It sort of pushes everyone in the community towards this optimal uh, trait value that's going to fit the environment the best. Now, how do we capture competition? Well, I'm going to argue we can use limiting similarity here. So we can use um, niche differences or niche similarity to uh, estimate the competition coefficient. So ecologists often think that maybe this one here is going to compete more intensely with the species that are similar to it and less intensely with species that are different from it. And we can use a Gaussian formula for that as well, right? Taking into account the variance, just like we did here, the width of the relationship. And we do that like this. We just compare the two traits. Right, this goes to 1 when they're identical, and it goes to 0 when they are completely different on opposite ends. So all this is saying is that species are gonna, that are similar are going to compete more intensely than species that are dissimilar. And we're using this variance term to say kind of what is the width of this relationship? How similar is too similar? We can define that as uh, niche width. And so this basically defines your niche differences. And so when we put all this back into the equation for f, we now see that the um, maximum possible fecundity for any species is going to defend on its suite of, depend on its suite of traits. And the competitive coefficient is now going to depend on my traits relative to my neighbor's traits. And we can do all this crazy calculus that we talked about before to find solutions to this game. And what's exciting about this is it lets us develop uh, an understanding of evolutionarily stable communities. And so I'm going to show you one here that eventually speciates from one to three to four species. Um, and as they do, again, I set the sort of carrying capacity to 100. And as they do, every individual is going to reduce in population size. We're going to do two traits. So if we look in this trait dimension, trait two, um, we can see this first species starts at zero. We get a speciation event. And we get another speciation event that are occurring in the same place that these colors are appearing, right? So after uh, 10 generations, we get a speciation event, etc. And the reason why you can only see three here is because these are the same in this trait dimension, that the purple and the red are the same in trait two, whereas the blue and the green are the same in trait one. You can actually plot the ratio of fitness differences to niche differences as they evolve through time. And so just like before, this is moving through time and we can see the niche differences basically evolving as they speciate into three different things. That's all I'm, I'm trying to show you here is that as we move in this direction, we get increasing niche differences as these species acquire different traits. And then here's what the final landscape would look like for this four species ESS. We've got two trait dimensions and all four species are sitting on peaks in this landscape. It's a little bit flat in the middle, but the, you can see that these are all peaks. So this is ESS and it's convergence stable. We could start it anywhere and it's gonna move to these four species eventually over enough uh, generations. And I can show you the video of how that actually works uh, here. So we're going to start with uh, one species and I'm going to stop it at the same place that I stopped this one. So you can see the two species are moving apart because of um, disruptive selection, heading towards peaks on the landscape. There's a point in the video where this should be behind and it looks like it's on top. I didn't know how to make that. Feel free to leave a comment if you know how. But So this should be down and behind. But you can see the saddle point already evolving that's going to take them to the four species community so that these are going to speciate and then move up in these two directions, ultimately landing on that final community uh, here with four different species. And so, so far I've been talking about the traits as if they're just purely mathematical things and I've been telling you not to worry about what they represent. But what do they represent? And so I want to show you one of my um, experiments here that is uh, a biodiversity experiment. So I have 25 different species out here that are all annual plants because I'm 
try to use this annual plant model. And they vary quite a bit in their trait values. And I've planted them in different combinations of one, two, four, eight, 16 species, and so on. But if we take a look at their trait values, the way Sandra Diaz did, um, what we see is that we get two principal components analysis uh, axes. So this is just a principal components analysis like uh, Sandra Diaz had done. These are my 25 species. Um, feel free to email me if you want to know what their names are. And what we see is that if we take a look at their seed size, their root length density, their leaf area, their height, their leaf thickness, their stem density, and their uh, sort of um, root mass per length, the thickness of their roots. We see that these species cluster quite a bit, right? And so what I've started doing is imagining that the PC scores are the traits of these species. And this has some extremely useful mathematical advantages. One of the advantages is that they're always symmetric around zero, which is really useful so that I can use the negative roots of my equations as well as the positive roots. Um, but they're also orthogonal to each other. So the assumptions of the multivariate Gaussian that we've been using work really well. So what that would mean is that this species here, fan, it has a trait of something like plus four and minus four, or sort of minus four on, on axis one and minus, or plus four on axis two. This species is zero and minus two, and so on. And what we can do from this is we can actually begin to fit these equations, and these are bad fits, this is very preliminary data, we can begin to fit these equations to estimate things like what is b and what is lambda max, right? In this case, uh, b is something like one and a half, and lambda max is something like two and a half million. Um, and that as species deviate from this sort of one and a half trait, so one and a half uh, would be somewhere around here, um, as species deviate from that optimal point where my cursor is sitting right now, they, in either direction, they lose uh, fecundity, but they might gain a competitive advantage. And so hopefully that makes sense. Um, this is one of the ways that I'm attempting to try to understand how I might use evolutionary game theory to answer some of those questions that I had back at the beginning. So we've come full circle. Um, I said at the beginning of this, uh, three-part series that I was interested in patterns of species diversity and mechanisms of coexistence and that uh, I think evolutionary game theory is a really powerful tool for that. I showed you how we can use two different flavors, matrix games and continuous games, to predict the kinds of things that should exist in, world, in the world as well as the amounts of those different things and begin to understand how those species are able to coexist through their uh, fitness similarities and their niche differences. And so um, this was a really rough and quick uh, introduction to evolutionary game theory. I'm sure that this is not going to allow you to go and become a game theorist, but hopefully it gave you some places to start reading and start uh, thinking about evolutionary game theory. And I would very much welcome you to reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, my research program is all about evolutionary game theory. So thanks for watching and uh, happy, uh, gameplay.